This is Washington, D.C., nerve center of the Western world. This is where the phrase, top secret, is the key to our national security. A phrase reserved for the eyes of a selected few. On this ordinary looking street lives an extraordinary man. A man who knows more about what is going on in secret today than anyone else outside the government. This man is Admiral Zacharias, wartime deputy director of United States Naval Intelligence. Tonight, for the first time, he brings an exclusive report from behind closed doors. Range ready? Ready. What you are listening to is the actual countdown prior to the launching of an intercontinental ballistic missile at Cape Canaveral, Florida. Seven seconds in counting. All recorders in the telegraph to fast. Vernier start. It is now minus ten seconds. Washington, test, failure. Good evening. A few seconds ago, you saw what actually happened in a test firing of an intercontinental ballistic missile. This particular missile had to be blown up when it went off course. But the test was not a failure. Our observers learned a great deal from it. Unfortunately, so did other uninvited observers. Our test firings have been watched by top Russian scientists whose information has been of vital importance to Moscow in the missile race. For the first time, I'm going to give you a report on how the Russians have been stealing our missile secrets and what occurs in order to prevent further espionage. This is the most restricted area in the United States, Cape Canaveral, Florida. Official designation, United States Air Force Missile Testing Center. This is Cocoa Beach, 10 miles due south of the test center. Main occupation, deep sea fishing. This seemed like the beginning of an ordinary day. It wasn't. You want me to go phone them at their motel, Skipper? Oh, we'll give them another 15 minutes. Okay, but I'm not gonna work on this drag no more. No telling whether we're gonna get to use it today. Wayne? Yeah, Herb? Call Sue for me, will you, and tell her that we won't be home till after supper. We're heading way out. Will do. They show yet? No, but they will. You should have made them leave a deposit last night. These people are taking you. ready, Skipper? You. See you tomorrow. Good luck. Yeah, you too, Herb. Don't forget to call Sue, huh? I sure won't. That's what I get for marrying me a nervous woman. <laughs> well, we're going to shove off now. You, uh, better keep working on that drag. You bet. <laughs> Looks like he belongs on a racetrack. Good morning, Miss Myers. Good morning, Captain. No, no, don't bother. I can manage that. 
Good morning, Ed. Good morning, sir. Well, ready to go? I thought there were to be four in the park. Well, the others, you know, they got hung up, but don't you worry. I'll pay what we agreed. Well, we'd better shove off. Good. Have a chair, Mr. Myers. Oh, thank you, Ed. Well, Joe, stand by to pass me that line, will you? A, a converted PT boat? Yeah. The Navy declared a surplus at the end of the war. Never surplus to me and the captain, though. We've had two big years on this baby. You're real attached to it. I know just what you mean. How's it going, Captain? Oh, just fine, Mr. Myers. Well, the name's Charlie. <laughs> What do you say we try our luck up around here, huh? Off the Cape? Just a hunch. I've hired your boat, you remember? That's so, Mr. Myers. You hired the boat. Okay. what I heard. Of course, could be scuttlebutt, but I heard they was going to fire one if the weather was right. The weather looks right. Uh, take the wheel. You won't find fish that way, Mr. Myers. You don't mind if I give it a try, do you, Commander? Commander? You're still in the reserves, aren't you? How did you know that? Oh, it figures. It's like the name of your boat, the Makita Chan. The Makita Channel off South Luzon in the Philippines. That's where you sunk an enemy destroyer, right? You know a lot, Mr. Myers. You hear a lot in a little town like yours. You must keep your ears wide open. What for? Just in position to see. Huh? Oh, yeah, we sure were. <laughs> Real stroke of luck. Are you uh, through, Mr. Myers, or uh, are you going to start fishing? I want to go right on fishing. <laughs> take a reel apart at one in the morning I'm putting and putting it together. Come on, tell. Oh, this guy I had out today. Can't figure him out. Maybe he was just a newspaper man trying to get some vantage point to see the test. Well, why wouldn't he have told me? Look, honey, he came on big. The sports shirt with the great big botanical garden. Toothy grin. Good old Joe stuff. 
Well, some things just didn't add up. Who can that be? I'll get it. Hello? Sue, like I told you, he said he might be getting back late. This late? That good one hasn't gotten in yet. I called the Coast Guard, but Herb hasn't radioed in. And he always does when he's going to stay out overnight. Sue, it's been a calm sea all day. Nothing could have happened to her. I know, I know, but I'm worried. Tell her I'll come over. Uh, Julie will come on over. Oh, no, I don't want her to. It's so late. Uh, she'll be over soon. Bye, Sue. Bye, Wayne. I'll drive you over. Now, don't worry, honey. Everything's going to be all right. Wayne Hollister went to the motel at which Charles Myers had claimed he was staying. The night manager said that Charles Myers was not registered there. In fact, Charles Myers had never been registered. Wayne Hollister drove directly to the missile testing center at Cape Canaveral. He showed his ID card as a commander in the Naval Reserve and asked to be directed to the intelligence office. The officer on duty in the intelligence office listened, took a few brief notes, thanked the commander for the information. He was very polite and very perfunctory. Or was he? Hello. Oh, Julie, how's everything? Wayne, I heard this dead. They're here from the Coast Guard right now. Uh, I'll be right over. No, better leave me alone with Sue. I can handle it. Go on now. No. Uh, I think I'll go down to the boat. Just feel like it. Uh, I'll drop by in the morning. All right.
quite nervous. Answer the question, mister. I came to see you. What for? I can use you. Commander, you went to Naval Intelligence tonight, didn't you? Now, how would I know that? Come aboard. Get inside. Why did you say so this morning? One of the chance to size you up. Fair enough. Your friend Herb Goodwin's dead. I know. Did you know his boat was rammed? What are you giving me? He was carrying radar. It was a clear day. Herb's too good a seaman to put his boat in front of anything. What about something that comes up all of a sudden, a hundred yards away from you? So the Russians really have got subs out there. What for? To look in on our missile tests? But what can they find out from a sub? These are not ordinary subs. They're specially equipped to track, record, and analyze our missiles. And they carry top scientific talent. We'll get the dope and process it as quickly as our men at the firing center. They get to find out almost as much as we find out. And Moscow gets the information just about the time it reaches Washington. Now, these observations, they're vital to the Kremlin in figuring out just how this missile race stacks up. Uh, they come in how close? Hmm. They stay away from our waters. They're smart. They know there isn't much we can do officially. But unofficially... What goes unofficially? You've got a boat. It's still a PT boat when you come right down to it. You've got navigational radar. You could pick up a surplus sonar pack. You might get a hold of some depth charges. And what do you do? I fix everything, and I come out with you. If it goes well, you won't get a medal. If it goes wrong, your widow won't get a pension. Mm. Neither will Herb Goodwin's widow. We can install it in one day. We'll install it tonight. They're putting up a missile at dawn tomorrow. Well, let me see, it's 3 o'clock in the morning now. I want to come aboard your boat at 8 o'clock tonight. Okay. It's a deal. See you later. It's wild, you know, wild. Oh, it's no wilder than some of the other things I could tell you about. It's a tough and it's a dirty business. You gotta outguess and outfight the other guy to stay alive. Everything goes. But you soon find out that the thing that goes best is the wildest, the most daring, the most impractical sounding scheme. You wouldn't believe some of the things I've been in on. But I'm still around, Commander. At 9.30 that night, the Marqueda Chan was docked six miles from Cocoa Beach. Working against time, Wayne Hollister, Ed Getty, and the man who called himself Charlie Myers, installed a sonar pack, a specially constructed depth charge rack and took aboard three depth charges. At dawn, the Marqueda Chan was prowling the area just outside the three-mile limit off Cape Canaveral. Hollister had the con. Getty operated radar and sonar. Myers attached detonators to the depth charges. Everything was ready. At Cape Canaveral, too, everything was ready. The work platforms of the tower were raised. Inside the blockhouse, the countdown continued. The tower was drawn away, leaving the missile standing alone. Any contacts? Not yet. A Russian submarine prepared to surface six miles south-southeast of Cape Canaveral. At the 
same time, the Atlas Intercontinental Ballistic Missile stood ready on its launching pad. Its last connection with the Earth was its fueling lines. Through these lines, liquid oxygen would be pumped into the missile's tanks. Constant pressure is mandatory. Any deviation could mean failure. Every valve has to open and close like clockwork. Inside the blockhouse, the countdown was at minus three minutes. On orders from the captain, Soviet crewmen searched for any shipping which might interfere with their operation. And the scientists prepared for their observations. At 4.35 a.m., a new blip appeared on the Makeda Chan's radar scope. I've got it. Right off our starboard beam, about 5,000 yards. On a course parallel to ours. We've made contact! The submarine also picked up a contact. Most Liquid oxygen transfer was underway. Still closing on her. About 3,500 now. The Russian submarine captain realized there was another craft on a converging course. At 4.53, the Russian submarine captain ordered his ship to dive. The scientists protested, but the captain stood by his decision. Everything was moved below. Range 2,500. She's holding course, we're still closing. Bearing 010, range 500. Stand by. Stand by! Bearing 000, range 200. Losing contact, we're going over. Drop it! Drop it! Drop it! Drop it! Drop it! did it. 
You filed us up. Oh, no. I didn't want to stick that sub. We dropped one can and they know it. Just like a shot right across their bomb. They didn't get to see this missile. And they won't get to see any of the others either. We just told them to keep their nose right out of our backyard. Why didn't you tell me that? If I did, you might have double-crossed me and given me the drop signal too soon. Huh? <laughs> you know, I might have at that. I've got news for you. You're never going to make a fisherman if you chase the big ones away. The Russians desire to continue observing our missile tests, so we can expect them to pull some new tricks from their sleeve. But we have some too. Next week, I'll tell you the story of a man behind the Iron Curtain with whom intelligence patiently maintained contact for 14 years in order to obtain information vital to our satellite program. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? I'm Cleet Roberts. My work is television reporting, largely in the field of foreign correspondence. In my career, I have met and talked with many military and government officials, not only in this country, but also abroad. The man I'm going to talk with today is one whose works and writings I've been familiar with for a long, long time. He's a native of Florida, a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, has been a naval officer for 38 years, 25 of which were spent in intelligence. He is the author of two bestsellers and has lectured extensively both here and abroad for the past 10 years. He retired from naval service with the rank of Rear Admiral. He is recognized throughout the world as one of the most astute and brilliant men in the fields of intelligence and espionage. I'd like to have you meet Rear Admiral Ellis M. Zacharias. Admiral, I'd like to ask you a few questions about your TV show, Behind Closed Doors. Well, go ahead, Cleet, but first of all, I want to thank you for that very flattering introduction. Now, what about Behind Closed Doors? What kind of stories are you going to tell in this series? Well, first of all, uh, we want to have stories that have never been told before, and particularly that uh, have not been presented to the television audience. In the second place, we want to have them as current as possible, but if necessary, we can go back many years in order to present those things that are of value to our present and future security. And in the third place, of course, as you know, they will deal with espionage and counter-espionage activities, which are extensive. Well, Admiral, how does it happen that you have access to these stories? Well, as you know, Cleet, I was exposed to uh, these activities for about 25 years. As a matter of fact, there were many intelligence and counter-intelligence episodes in which I participated personally. Well, do you get your information from uh, intelligence services? No, I meticulously avoid that because, as you know, in my lectures of the past 10 years, I did not want to have it said that I was obtaining information from the intelligence department and then talking about it in public. Well, you know, working for many years as a war correspondent, I've always been, uh, well, I've had a high regard for military security, for intelligence clearance. When I was working in a military theater, I would have to submit my copy for censorship or for clearance. Do you have to uh, submit these stories for intelligence clearance? Well, uh, Cleet, uh, in view of the fact that I had a hand in writing of many of the security regulations that we have today, I have a full appreciation of the necessity for it. So as a result, we uh, do keep the government departments concerned, informed of what we're saying and doing in order to uh, avoid any conflict with their work. 
and also to give them an opportunity to uh, inform us of those things that they think might be controversial or embarrassing and to relieve a situation of that kind. Well, Admiral, let's be specific for a minute. You say these are espionage stories. Uh, give me an example, if you will. Well, uh, you remember when our occupation forces went into Germany, there went along with them a scientific team which had for its purpose uh, getting all the available information on the status of German atomic developments and also the availability of some of the German scientists. Well, they got a few of the scientists, but uh, they missed some. As a matter of fact, our story next week is going to relate to one of the men who was taken behind the Iron Curtain, but we were able to keep in touch with him over a period of about 14 years and obtain much information that was valuable to our satellite program. Did you get him out of there? Yeah, he was finally gotten out. And you'll tell that in the story, eh? Yes, that is, that will be told in the story. Sounds pretty exciting. Now, would you say that, uh, would you say that the series, the stories you tell, have a positive quality? Do they contribute anything to the sum total of the welfare of this country right now? Yes, I, I think that definitely they will give our people a knowledge of the scope and importance of intelligence and, uh, I hope, uh, psychological warfare. Well, Admiral, it sounds as though it does have a moral purpose. It sounds as though it uh, will be exciting. Perhaps I'm prejudiced as a working newsman, but the sort of thing you're talking about has always interested me, and I've noticed that it has always interested many millions of people when the stories have been told or just hinted at through the usual media, the usual medium of uh, communication. I wish you the best of luck with your new series. Thank you very much. I think it is a different kind of program. You know, there have been a lot of television shows, but uh, they've been fabricated from whole cloth in the main. They have not been authentic. They've been based upon imagination. But now we have something that is wholly different, something that is unique, something that is based upon fact. I think it uh, may very well set the nation on its ear.